Give us wisdom concerning the issues that we face. Lord, we give you the glory for what we accomplish in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Meadow Street, and I think I know about five of you guys. 
So it's nice to be here, and, and I'm like, wow, look at this building. I remember meeting in that little place over there. And I'm sorry I haven't been to the meetings in such a long time, but uh, I, I, I myself, I'm like, this man, I, I think the name really doesn't have that much to do with the students. I know Mark here is doing a superintendent. It's doing a fantastic job. But I would like to recommend two people, and you probably you'll say, well, who in the world is that? Well, one of them is Mr. George Mason uh, Sims, and also Mr. W. E. Sampson. Mr. Sims was the first superintendent of Port Arthur, and he did a lot for this, the education. At one time, Port Arthur was number one in the nation with the education system. Mr. Simpson was at Lincoln, and he was the assistant to Mr. Sims. And also, he did a lot. They're the ones, Mr. Sims and Mr. Sampson both worked together to put up the finest education for the West Side. And they both together put Lincoln High School and everybody from that school at that time came out with a very good education. And I'm a product from Lamar School, Franklin School, Woodrow Wilson School, and Thomas Jefferson High School. I've been one year to pull off a business school. But I'm a product of this here, from this area, from the schools. They gave me a good education. Um, I moved from Port Arthur, I'm sorry, but I moved to Houston. I've been back since 2001, and I really wanted to see the school system to change because all you heard since I was so involved in politics in Houston, you heard about when I said I was moving back to Port Arthur. Why do you want to move back there, right? That town is going to park. And I thought, well, I'll move back and change, change the area. But I did. But when you got the superintendent here, I know that he's changing the school. I know that the education is, is a lot better than it was when I first went back here. So I, I would like to nominate those two people. I feel like that they have done fantastic for this city. Thank you. Thank you. Austin McElroy, Mr. Austin McElroy. Good evening, uh, uh, Dr. Portier, honorable board members, uh, friends, and, and citizens of Port Arthur. I had no intentions of speaking today. I rolled down here from Baytown with my wife, Brad Sharp McElroy, just to, just to kind of see what was going on. I had heard mention of my dad, A.Z. McElroy, being considered as a, you know, at the end of the name change, and uh, I just wanted to come down here and uh, feel his spirit in this, this beautiful school board room that you guys have. He would have loved it. Um, but like I said, I have no, no prepared words. Um, this, is, this is kind of emotional for me. It's, it's, uh, in two weeks, it'll be 28 years since, uh, since he left us, uh, almost a half a mile from here. Um, but as a family member and representing the other members of my family who couldn't make it because of distance and because of work, um, I left work early because I had to be here. Uh, I just want to give you a perspective of what we felt about him as his children. I'm his second son. <clears throat> that man loved Port Arthur. That man loved Port Arthur. He loved the school district. He went to school at Lincoln. He taught at Lincoln. He coached at Lincoln uh, up until 1965. Uh, the very following year, 1966, even though he was starting out a successful business, he ran for the school board. Uh, no black had ever served on the school board here. Um, and I think he did a fine job. He served up until 1990. He taught many board members how to be board members, black and white. He brought along people. He didn't get to a spot and forget about where he came from. He brought people <coughs> up, black and white, Hispanic. He served on national committees. Uh, he chaired national committees. He, he would 
he would meet with presidents and senators and come back to town and the first thing he wanted to do was go to West 7th Grants and play dominoes, roll up his sleeves and be amongst the people again. But uh, the boards that he served on, it wasn't about educating black children, although that was very important. It was disadvantaged children. It was all children. Um, I think he led this, this school district through a, a tumultuous time during the days of uh, breaking down segregation and integrating the schools. I was a part of that. Seconds. I'm sorry? 30 seconds. You got 30 seconds. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Um, I was a part of that, and I think he, uh, I think he did it in leadership uh, and, and brought put up through that pretty smoothly. I know when I went to TJ, we, we had a couple of tough days, but we all got along. We were friends, and we set an example, I think, for, for the upcoming generations. I'm just honored that he's being considered, uh, whether he makes it or not. I think it's been time, but we're good with it. But I, I'm just grateful that you guys are considering him, and, uh, and, and it would mean a lot for us to see his memory finally embedded in, in Port Arthur, the city that he loved. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Reverend Kaylin Gardner. Board of Trustees, while some may say that names have already been decided, the agenda says possibly renamed, so that must mean there's still a chance that it may not be renamed. So today I stand before you not only as the president of the NAACP, not only as the proud pastor of the First Sixty Baptist Church, but as a young African American male who has been a part of a group that has been targeted and has been the victim of social injustice for the last several years. Today, I myself and along with other organizations and citizens of Port Arthur are here to request that you make the decision that will probably place you on the right side of history. Due to the national campaign and racial climate of our nation, the decision we're asking you to make is to remove and rename the two elementary schools that are named after past Confederate leaders being in the persons of Robert E. Lee and Dick Dobbin. Both of these elementary schools bear the names of Confederate leaders who benefited greatly from the southern slave trade. So what message do we send our children by idolizing and honoring those who such strong principles claim of fighting a war in defense of the evil institution of slavery? So Dr. Puerto Rico, Board of Trustees, the decisions you make right now define the moments in our hearts of our children. Our children are watching closely as we set the course of history. While we understand that there may be pressure coming from opposing foes who would claim that removing the names would erase history, but that doesn't make sense. You cannot erase history. For history will forever be embedded in books, and it also will be ever and forever embedded in the hearts of the oppressors and the oppressees. So for decades, Klansmen, neo-Nazis, and white national not white nationalists defended these names and their statues as an innocent representation of the American heritage. But we know that these symbols glorify treason and a hateful history of white supremacy and black subjugation. In order for our country, our state, our communities to move forward, to become a nation united and free from bigotry, we must remove Confederate symbols from our parks, streets, communities, and our schools that define the American landscape of this culture. So we, the people of Port Arthur, the NAACP, and myself, we oppose any symbolization that honor the painful history of our past, and we now submit to you and ask you to please renew these names so we can move on and move forward as a community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Reverend Judge Thurman Barty. Children in this fair city of Port Arthur, Texas, I convey 
sincere gratitude for allowing participation in this process to offer names for consideration to attach to our educational facilities. The name that I present is no strange name to this community, this state, or this nation. I implore you to consider and subsequently accept the name of Alfred Z. McElroy for the newly built elementary school in the Port Angeles area that will replace the Dowling Elementary School. Mr. A. Z. McElroy's name is offered for consideration because of his historic civic service to this community, to the state, and to this nation. In 1966, Mr. McElroy became the very first ever African American to serve as a trustee on this august and distinguished Board of Education, known as PAISD Board of Trustees. He was elected to six three-year terms and served as president in 1968, 1974, 1981, and 1987. Matt, as he was affectionately known, was a product of segregation, separate but equal, even the Jim Crow era. Yet, in 1949, he graduated from Lincoln High School, later matriculated at Wally College, where he earned his baccalaureate degree, and then he even served our great country in the United States Army. Returning to Port Arthur in 1956 to begin a career in education as a mathematics and a mathematics teacher and a coach. In 1962, he became athletic director and head football coach until 1965. In 1970, Mr. A.G. McElroy delivered national recognition to the PAISD Board of Trustees. He did this by being appointed by then President Richard Milhouse Nixon to the National Advisory Council on Education of this advantaged children in America. He even served as chairman of this group from 1971 through 1974. Also in 1974, he was recommended by then U.S. Senator John Towers to our sitting president at the time, Gerald Ford, as a nominee for the appointment of the National Advisory Council on Equality of Educational Opportunities and was later confirmed by the U.S. Senate. He was also a delegate to the conference on inflation in 1974. Mr. McElroy was noted mostly for his service in this community in 1970 by his actual work with the Desegregation Act that was handed down. I know that my time is up. That's why I had it written out for you. I know that you all are a learned group of individuals who are literate. You will be able to read these other accolades, but not on the accolades for points that I think to be considered as you rename this newly built school in the Port Angeles area in which Mr. McElroy raised his family and lived here in this community. And I would want to leave and say this, if I may, that each of you who sit here actually have a debt to Mr. McElroy because you are sitting where he said you are where he allowed himself to let God use him to begin what we have here now in the city of Port Arthur. Thank you for this opportunity. God bless you, and please do consider. Miss mm, Tasia Moore Star. <coughs> Tasia Moore Star. Leon Wright. Good afternoon and to the board. I thank you for this opportunity. I didn't intend to speak, but after what I've heard, I think it's necessary for me to say, I'm not here to talk about the name change. But the name change has given me an opportunity to address the board and the public about what my concerns are. I'm more concerned Excuse about- Excuse me, sir. Hold on just a moment, please. We have silence in the gallery. 
My uh, doctor dissertation was in African American studies. Many of you might not know who I am, but Lamar University did not have African American studies until I was a member and a student, a student, first student body president of Lamar University. Many of you don't know who I am. But, Excuse me, it, sir. For the record, could you identify yourself, please? Leon Wright. So you are Yes, I am. Better known as Tate House Morning Star on Green's Radio Station. I think that we are fighting the wrong battle about a name change because in 1900, Carter G. Woodson proposed to the public education system that African American studies should be in public schools. All over this country, we have Latinos and Asian communities who are insisting that their history be in their schools. What's in the name? I would be as opposed to changing the name of Malcolm X from the school as anybody would be to Robert E. Lee. We fight about the Confederate in fact, they're fighting about the Robert E. Lee battle flag and not the Confederate flag. We're fighting in a controversy about a name when our test scores of our children are so low. It has been proven, and I can give you information later, I'm not going to belabor you with a lot of statistics and, and surveys, but if you want to contact me personally, I can give you the information. It has been proven that Students, non-color and color, achieve best when they know about their cultural history. The gentleman first said something about history. You can't change it. But it is necessary for the history of the oppressors and the inferiors and the superiors to be in our public schools. That is the only way we can begin to rub elbows with each other and decide that no man is beneath another man or woman. We found that out in Lamar University. When they tried to change Lamar University to two colleges, to two colleges because of African Americans, yes ma'am, going to uh, Lamar University, I spearheaded the move that they would change it to uh, Lamar University because then it was called Lamar uh, College of Technology. People don't know that about me. And now Lamar is one of the greatest schools in the Southeast Texas. Port Arthur Independent School District. I was educated in an inferior called school. My best teacher was Miss Lizzie Miller, and she taught me about history. History is a key to people beginning to understand each other. If you haven't read The Miseducation of the Negro, I'll call G. Wilson. You, Please get it. Thank, Thank you. That concludes the people who signed up for this portion of public hearings. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak to this public hearing? Would you please approach the floor? Identify yourself, please, sir. This is Greg Richard. Uh, yeah, glad, three minutes. Three minutes. I'm glad to see uh, people finally jump on the bandwagon for some stuff I started. Mr. Richards, are you going to speak to us? I'm speaking. I'm speaking for lack of a Address, relax, to address the out. board, please, sir. Address okay. this board with okay. civility and respect. Okay. Like I said, I'm glad to see people finally jump on the bandwagon. I started back in 2005 about these two name changes. Originally, it started with rebuilding the new Rodney Lee. I done talked to Lewis Reed, Mackey, uh, the other three, two. Superintendent before that. So basically, I've been doing this. I mean, y'all just coming and I appreciate y'all coming out, but give you more here. I hate repeating myself for people who haven't been here before. Robert E. Lee and Dick Dollar were tyrants. They committed insurrection against the United States government. Lee was stripped of his citizenship. And the people on the Port of Penn School District back in 1929, they knew all this. They, this guy, he couldn't even vote, but they decided, they were all white guys, they decided they don't name the school after a uh, Mr. Richards, please just stick to what you would like to I'm say. I'm telling you about history. You're getting off task, sir, please. Okay. First of all, I, that's in a memo out. None of you all were on, on the school board back in 2007 with suggested names. 
Barbara Jacket was one, as well as A.C. McElroy, and then they had uh, some other notable African Americans to take the place of Robert E. Lee before it was built. So I, I've been submitted that years ago. No one called me. I, 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 I was the first one to put the names out there. I was the first one to say, hey, these names, that's not correct. You should not have black kids going to school after the guy that fought to keep black people in slavery. I've been said that. I mean, so hopefully you guys will, will get stuck off, get off stupid and change his names with quickness. Okay? It's, it's time, it's been time. You should have did it five, it should have been like 2005 when I first told y'all. So that's all I gotta say. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak to the public hearing on the renaming of the school? Yes, sir, please. And please identify yourself for the audience. Well, uh, first of all, we'll give things back. Uh, my name is Dan Gasper. Um, I'm uh, with the NAACP. Uh, you Sorry, come you're to addressing the board. Oh, I'm also sorry. Board. Um, well, yeah, my name is David Gasper. Um, most, some of you guys uh, know my face. I'm a uh, community leader. Um, I'm over the youth council of the NAACP. And um, I just want to give my reasons for why I feel like the school should be changed. And first, before I even do that, I just want to honor you guys. Because honestly, out of all of put out that you guys have been like the spearhead of change. Even with, uh, I don't, this is not a time to talk about other branches of government, but you guys have truly been the spirit of change. So I want to just thank you guys so much for that. But um, really the reason why I want the school names to be changed is just for logical reasons. Um, usually the main negation for the school change is the preservation of history. We need to preserve history. But when you actually understand when these things were put in place, the, the, the sound of preservation of history is malarkey. It's complete malarkey and it's not true at all. Like the man said, uh, 1929, uh, from uh, Jane Daly, a professor at the University of Chicago, made uh, research and seen that actually most of these com commemorations of the Confederacy, whether they be monuments or school names, were implemented during the most, the highest racial tensions right. in America, during which were 1900s and the 1950s and 60s. And so these are the main reasons why these names should be changed, because these names were not put in ambiguously or um, idly, but methodically. And they knew exactly what they were doing when they were implementing these names. When we have, when we're looking back, uh, Beth Orwork, the candidate for uh, Texas uh, Senator, running against Ted Cruz said, when we look back, we are the ancestors of our future. When we look back, what are we going to tell our kids? Knowing that we have this information presented to us, knowing that, these, knowing that these people did not even put these Confederate monuments in place to honor these soldiers, but to spread a white supremacy self, a KKK self. These were implemented strictly for racism. And, uh, I, and I'm going to uh, touch on uh, what one of, one of the uh, men said earlier. Um, yes, it, it is true that we need to start learning more about our history, but the number one thing before we even talk about history is representation. We not, not only have one of the brightest African, -Amer so African American students in our uh, population or our census in the school district, we have a profound, a profuse amount of Hispanics, uh, of Hispanic uh, people um, who, uh, who are in our school district. Actually, even in Lee, we have, according to the Texas TDA in 2017, we have 73% of Hispanics in the elementary school. So, just knowing this, just knowing that you guys have spearheaded so much change in Prague, I know that you guys can be the key to so much more. And I thank you so much for all your time, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak to the public hearing on the renaming of the elementary schools? Is there anyone else that wishes to speak to the public hearing on the renaming of the two elementary schools? If there's no one else in the public hearing, this public hearing we thank you for your participation. The next public hearing is the creation of Perth Four Refining Group Reinvestment Zone. Thank you, President Ambrose. We will have Mrs. Molly Hamby come, and I'll ask her to introduce the uh, party with me. Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Porter, thank you for your time today. My name is Molly Hamby. I'm one of the consultants that was engaged back in July of 2017 when an application <laughs> was submitted by a private board refining group uh, for a Chapter 313 Agreed Value Limitation Agreement. Um, I have with me tonight Kathy Mathias. Uh, she's from Boat Casey Associates and those, that's the other consultant that was engaged 
to do all the school financial impact analyses of this application on your district. There's also representatives from Crown Court. If the board does have specific questions for Crown Court, they're here for you as well tonight. Uh, the first public hearing that's happening on the reinvestment zone is related to the application that will be under consideration tonight. When the company applied to the district, they carved out a very specific location within the existing refinery for where they'd be locating new assets. Um, when they would like to have an agreement signed with you, they have to have a reinvestment zone that matches what was presented in that application. Now, as time has progressed over a year and they've actually outlined where the assets are going to be, they're not 100% in that same area, so the county has created a larger area for their reinvestment zone, but the comptroller's office requires a school district to act on the application exactly as it was presented to you back in July. So this is an administrative step that we're asking the board to consider tonight. Uh, it doesn't create any uh, benefit to any taxpayer. All it does is identify the area in the application as the area that is described in the application. Um, it it's only says this area is where it's going to be and is a necessary first step should the board wish to approve the application later tonight. Thank you. We also have with us uh, Valero's uh, plant manager, Mr. Mark Sobel. We have Steve Evans, comptroller, and Russell Miner from the tax office. So I would at this time, we're going to move into the second one, but if uh, one of the gentlemen would like to come and approach the podium, we'll give you an opportunity as well for the first and the second. Thank you, Dr. Porter Ian. Uh, Board of Trustees. My name is Mark Stobel. I'm the Vice President and Manager of the uh, Valero Refinery. You know, we're here tonight to seek support for a project that will improve the uh, operability of the plant. Uh, we want to build another unit that will give us the flexibility to not do major maintenance every six years. I think you're all familiar with the word turnaround. That's when we shut a unit down. And today we have one Coker unit. It's a unit called the Coker. And every six years, we have to do major maintenance on it. Uh, this project is to build another poker so we would have two trains and really allow us to spread that maintenance out over two years. I think, you know, there's a lot of benefits to the city of Port Arthur in the area. To be able to use our contractor workforce uh, uh, more efficiently so we don't have these huge ramp-ups in the projects uh, every six years versus, you know, allowing us to move these uh, uh, maintenance events every two years on some of the units. And uh, with that, the nested contractors people will move into the area because they'll have steady jobs versus ramping up and ramping down. Uh, the project is about a $950 million investment. Uh, we expect to have about 40 permanent jobs at the Valero facility. And, uh, you know, we try to do as much hiring as we can locally and uh, certainly support the community. So it's a a uh, project that has not been approved yet, but we're seeking your support to, to help move that project along. How you doing today? Very good. With this uh, expansion, you will have jobs available for and apprenticeships and training for local people. When you say local, does that mean the photo author residents or all of Jefferson, Orange, and Chambers County? I know what we have with photo author. Lamar Port Arthur, we have kids that attend school for process operator instrumentation. Uh, how would that become available for those kids and adults that we have in Port Arthur? Because I know with the expansion, you're going to have training and apprenticeship programs. Yes. Well, it, the, for the candidates that apply, uh, we do internal training for the operations piece of it. Uh, we also have apprenticeships in the metal trays and machinists and electrical uh, parts of the plant. Uh, we are working with an Economic uh, Development Commission here in Port Arthur to try to get you know, candidates out of the community and uh, to make those available. But certainly, you know, it's to our advantage to have people here local that don't have to travel far uh, to come to work. You know, we, Valero is a big supporter of the community and we're certainly do everything we can to hire as many people out of 
this area, Port Arthur, uh, the surrounding areas we can. The opportunity will be there. So there will be publicly put out on how the citizens of Port Arthur will be able to get into a... Yes. Uh, yeah, and we're also, you know, working with our contractors, uh, you know, to encourage them to use, you know, as much local uh, manpower as we can here for the project. It's about a two-year construction project. Uh, probably would peak out at about 1,500 to 1,700 jobs uh, over that course of the period, and then again, be another 40 permanent jobs, uh, or jobs once the project's complete. So is it possible that we can add language to the chapter 313 that uh, Port Arthur residents could be added into the training and apprenticeships program that Valero will have? Is it possible we can add that type of language to the chapter 313? Okay, and also um, Molly Hammond is going to address that. And one thing that we need to um, realize is that in 2020, we had our first graduating class from the Wilson Curley College. That college will allow us to see. We have 60 credit hours that we are paying for our children to attend Lamar State College. So that is going to be a two-track, two a career track and a secondary. And also, in today's paper, uh, I think it was a grand um, article that said that Lamar State College received $1.6 million, and they're going to build a process operation technical school uh, right near the new building that they uh, have, have just constructed. So I think we will have a lot of opportunities to, ch um, to train our students. In this hand, one moment, Dr. Porter, um, Madam President. I want to uh, piggyback off what uh, Trustee Lofton was talking about because as we were talking about putting those codicils in the contract in the 313 agreement, the other thing that we talked about was we had very, we had a lot of uh, uh, questions about as well whether or not we could put language in because we know that uh, many of the value the valuations have been challenged here recently recently as well and so we want to try to see if we can put that as well in the 313 agreement so I wanted to piggyback off what uh, Trustee Lofton was saying as you're asking that question you can do it all at once. <laughs> Certainly, thank you. Um, so to answer your question first, unfortunately the 313 agreement is not a vehicle for job creation in the sense of engaging people locally. We can make them have a set number of jobs. We can make them pay a wage, but we can't require where those jobs come from. When we start asking them to contribute job training programs and uh, apprenticeships, that counts against the money that we can negotiate directly to the school district. Because the statute has a strict limitation on how much a school district can receive in exchange for granting one of these agreements. It's $100 per student per ADA per year. Any other gift or donation, or in this case, education found program, would count against that $100 per ADA. So when that money that we've negotiated for you comes in, you can, if that is something, put more money to your training programs that you would like, because that comes in outside the school finance program. It's just miscellaneous revenue that you get to direct without worrying that the state's going to come back and pull it back for you. Um, it's going to be about $900,000 a year that you can put towards that program yourself. But if we were to have them do that, it would cut into that $900,000. But but I'm not only speaking for the students that we have in Port Arthur. I'm speaking of the community of Port Arthur. Uh, and, I, and I do understand that, sir. Um, but we can't put that in the 313 agreement. It's just if anything we put in there that's a requirement in terms of something that the company must do counts against how much money we can get for you. So even though it's, because the definition of person is not just school district, it's not just school district students, the comptroller has defined the word person to be anybody in exchange for this agreement. So if you're requiring the company to do something that has a financial value, such as requiring jobs or providing job training, that counts against that $100 for student average daily attendance. So, with, he just said it would be 40 permanent jobs, which mainly would consist of operations and maintenance. You mean to tell me we couldn't add that out of those 40, 15 has to be a resident of Port Arthur? Not through this agreement. That is something that can be done through your county agreements, like 
your Jefferson County agreement, if they do an abatement, they can require local hiring, but unfortunately the school district does not have the authority to have a mandate of jobs located within your school boundaries. What, Within, is, I'm what, sorry. what do you consider local? What do I consider local? Yeah. I, if I were to say, I would say Jefferson County, but I'm not from your area, so I don't know. Yeah, that would probably be much more useful. So what do you consider local, sir, when you say, uh, when you speak of hiring? Well, I, I, I agree. It's, and the applications go out to anybody in the county. We advertise across the county. We don't go into Houston or those other areas. Sometimes it happens by word of mouth, but you know, we recently hired a class of, uh, of uh, 30 operators because, you know, through attrition, you know, about every you know, year and a half we'll bring in a new class of operators, and they're actually graduating this Friday. Uh, and I believe four of those, or four or five, were from, actually from Port Arthur, the majority were from the county. I don't have those exact figures with us, but it's, again, it's to our advantage. We don't want our people commuting 60 or 70 miles. We'd rather have them right here. And, I mean, I try to get as close as I can. <laughs> Hi, my name is Steve Evans. I'm the refractory controller. I work for this man right here. Uh, to local, according to the abatement that we signed with the county, is actually the, it's a nine county surrounding area. So it's not just Jefferson County, it's Orange, Hardin, and the others that, are, that surround it. Uh, but when we think about local, we think about Port Arthur and, and really the, uh, the big county area. Now, to your point, as far as hiring, I would, I would say that uh, we have existing agreements with the city of Port Arthur that address the concerns that you are. We have in lieu of the lieu of tax agreements with the city of Port Arthur that helped us on that front that, exist, that existed for many years. And they actually have hiring incentives in there for Port Arthur residents specifically. And so the better that we do on that point, the better, the less tax that we get tax credits based on the amount of hiring we do. So on average, we hire about 10 to 15 percent Port Arthur residents with every hiring class. Uh, that has held true for about the last eight years since I've been here looking at it. Um, I would expect it would continue, but when we look at candidates, uh, we, we, public, uh, we publish that out, broadcast it out in the paper. Um, it's put out on the website. It's widely available for anybody to apply. So when we entertain qualified candidates, all else being equal, if you've got a Port Arthur resident, a non-Port Arthur resident, we'll select a Port Arthur resident. That's what we do. Madam President. Not the attorney, if um, Ms. Jeans could ex please explain to the public what exactly a Chapter 313 is, because I think we're getting a little for what a Chapter 313 agreement is and, ha and how it is important to the school district. Dr. Porter? Alright, so a Chapter 313 agreement is an agreement with a qualifying company, and here it's a manufacturing company, that for a 10 year period, no matter what the product is, project is valued at, for 10 years, it will be assessed at $30 million for M&O purposes only. So if it's $900 million, if it's $100 million, your appraisal district will report to you that it's $30 million for M&O purposes. For INS purposes, it's fully taxed. And so this is actually a good segue to your question that you piggybacked earlier on because I'm, I'm happy to report Dr. Cordery and Ms. Ms. Jeans were very tough negotiators and we'll be presenting the first agreement of this kind throughout this program that's been around since 2001. We actually have an agreement with the company that should they fail to maintain a set value, they're going to be required to make a bond payment into your accounts to maintain your INS taxable value. So if you're planning projects down the road, you have certainty into how much your INS values will be, how much it will generate for you. But this is typically only an M&O project that limits it for just M&O. So this is the first of its kind. Uh, but the company also makes other, other commitments to your area. They don't just get this 10-year benefit and then disappear. They have to keep operating here five extra years. And if at any time they fail to meet one one aspect of this agreement, if you approve it tonight, they owe back 
every dollar that they have saved. And that comes back to you as delinquent tax collections. And those come with hefty penalties. <laughs> so this is an agreement that really encourages the company to stay. And now it actually is an agreement that you can feel confident that you're not uh, agreeing to something without knowing what it will look like for you five years down the road, ten years down the road. The agreement actually says this is what you will be able to receive in terms of taxes. So this is just strictly positive for the school district? It is absolutely a positive for the school district. Um, there are, and I, if I may, I'd like to invite Kathy Mathias up. She can give you the direct details. I can give a big picture, great ideas about it, but she'll tell you exactly the dollars that will be coming to your district directly outside the school finance system, but just money for you guys to spend. While she's coming, I want to thank Dr. Porter and uh, Ms. Jean uh, for that. That is great news for our board. Uh, we did, as a board, talk to you about that, uh, putting that in, and thank you so much. Uh, the children of Port Arthur will thank you for that. The city of Port Arthur will thank you for that as well. So that's great. That's great news. Thank you. Madam President, board, member, board members, and Dr. Courtney, my name is Kathy Mathias from Upcasing Associates. We have been your consultants on all your Technical 313 projects for all these years. Um, we've enjoyed working with you. We appreciate the opportunities. So, I can keep a couple for myself. <laughs> kind of important. So, as Molly explained, this project will go on your tax rolls for MNO purposes at $30 million. The agreement calls for a revenue loss protection calculation that calculates if you had not approved the agreement with the company had built anyhow and done this project, how much money you would have gotten from the system, from the school finance system, your local taxes, how much you would have had in that case compared to what you have when the little goes on the roll in the in the limitation period for $30 million. The agreement has a revenue protection clause in there and the company agrees to pay you any revenue you would have lost because you approved the agreement. What we tend to do every year is we'll calculate for you and have been calculated for you in the past, under past agreement what the revenue loss is for all these agreements every year by November the 1st. So on this page spreadsheet that you got, the company says the project will go on the rolls in 22-23, which isn't that far out anymore, uh, under the value limitation, that'll be the first year of $30 million. We assume your tax rate constant for future purposes, even though it could change over years with some of the issues. Um, New Chapter 313 project value does not count for rollback purposes, so that's good news on this one. So if we can't look at your rate at $1.17, you're going to, the company's going to save $5.7 million at column I. If you had collected all of the taxes on that project, which would be $6 million, you would have generated, you would have had recapture on it. The limitation will save you some recapture, but it doesn't save you all the recaptures. You would still pay you would lose in recapture payments four and a half million dollars if you had not if you had not approved the agreement. Or because you did the limitation agreement, you lose four and a half million dollars. The company's going to hold you harmless for that. This is our estimate today. By 22-23, the value may or may not be the 522 and a half million that they say right now. It'll be whatever the actual appraised value is that year. Um, we'll, re we'll recalculate all the estimate back at the end of time. As Molly said, the agreement calls for an additional payment to the district outside the revenue loss. The revenue loss is outside the school finance system completely. You get to do what you want with it. Um, the separate loan payment is specified in law that can only be at the most $100 per ADA. And so in the agreement, it specifies the payment schedule for that $100 per ADA for 16 years of the agreement. And it would start in 22-23 when the company has tax savings of, and it would be $989,000 a year for 16 years. So at, overall, at the end of the limitation period, you would have made four and a half million, or gotten four and a half million from the company on revenue loss, and an additional $12.8 million on the supplemental payment. The company still has big tax savings, so it's good for you guys and it's good for them as well. So the, the 313 benefits everybody in the community. Um, so, but the whole deal is you don't, you don't lose money by doing this. The company holds you harmless for any money you would have had if you had not done it. Does that explain it well enough? Mm -hmm. okay. Is, are there any questions regarding this public hearing? Yes, sir. Can I have the floor, please? Please. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you guys
guys may not know this, but I'm a quasi-labor uh, consultant. Uh, what you don't, what they're not telling you is this. At least a quarter to a third of the nation's jet fuel is produced right here in this area right here, Port Arthur. Why am I telling you this? Because the United States government, among other entities, contract out to produce this jet fuel, which says that they're under the guise of the EOC, the Department of Labor, to abide by certain laws and rules. Now, they're supposed to submit an EEO-1 report every October, or last of every October, breaking down the workforce by gender, race, and ethnicity. So, uh, you know, in my, my, my particular experiences with major corporations like that, they'll say, well, we can't find qualified people. You can have all the training you want for these kids training, but train only enough of them unless they give you a job. I came here in 2000 from uh, Los Angeles. There's nobody in Tri-County knows more about quality issues than me. I could not get a single job at none of these before. I built nuclear reactor cores, I built international space station parts. These people were not hiring black people. They were keeping it as lily white as they could. I mean, I had all the, so I'm telling you, just don't buy the hype to tell you about they're going to do this, they're going to do that. At the end of the day, unless the Department of Labor or the EOC pressure them, which they don't do, they don't do their job. I mean, you have to force them to do it. But I'm telling you, since you're paying tax money to them, they're not representing you equally with job. Look at the people that's represented by Valero. You ain't seen a black face there. Why? There's no talented black people in Valero to come here and talk to us. So what they're telling you now about all this good stuff, they're going to do this and they're going to do that, at the end of the day, watch and see. That's all I got to tell you. All you have to train for all these kids, you I had all the training in the world. I was school on a minority engineering scholarship program. Where they give me when I came back here to Jefferson County? Nowhere. So just keep that in mind when they tell you about all this training and these jobs they're going to give you this, that, and other. The last I looked, all the jobs coming, all the people coming in, the profit coming in from 73 and everywhere else in one. Fourth has the second highest unemployment rate in the state. Depending on the price of a barrel of oil, this, this city is producing about maybe 20 to 40 million dollars per day. Calculate it out. They're, they're, they're processing a million barrels of oil a day. Multiply with a barrel of oil as you get a rough estimate how much money these companies are making per day. They're, they're making a lot of money to say this city is one of the poorest cities. The district is a poverty district. The city's got one of the highest unemployment rates in the state. Yet they're making all this money and they're not hiring us. So keep that in mind. Don't, don't take my word for this. Go research yourself and check out. You will verify that everything I've told you is true. So I'm, I'm a witness to that. Don't, 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 don't the only way I was able to get to the plant support when I came in 2002, I worked for labor and being exploited. Getting $7 an hour. Looking at people that have had this experience with me. I'm never. Hmm? Okay, all, all I'm telling you is this, just because you got education, you got all this training, that don't mean nothing. I mean, they can show a few, few million here, a few million there, but they're making millions and millions a day. Look, look where you're at right now, so I'm telling you. Next slide. Are there any other questions regarding the public hearing? Are there any other questions regarding the public hearing? If there are no other questions, I mean, that closes the public hearing session of our meeting. Um, now, under the authority of the Texas Government Code, Section 551.071, 551.074, the board will meet in a closed meeting to one, consult with attorney regarding or contemplate litigation, including settlement offers and other legal matters, in which the duty of the attorney to the governmental body under the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct of the State Bar of Texas are clearly covered by attorney client privilege. Two, consider personnel regulations. Texas Government Code 551 as follows. Consider and or appropriate approve the employment of teachers. And three, consider and or appropriate approve the termination of a professional employee. We will now adjourn into closed session. Excuse me, one, one final word, please. I thank you all for coming uh, to participate in these public hearings. The Board of Trustees will render a final decision in regards to the remaining of the schools at our October board meeting. Thank you very much.
Uh, Armando Gutierrez from the city of Port Arthur. Is he available? Dr. Porter? Yes. Mr. Yes. Gutierrez. Well, thank you, um, Madam President. Um, Mr. Gutierrez is with us, and we're going to hear from him. We want to thank the, the, the Port Arthur Port City for coming tonight to propose what we think is something good for our students as a safety uh, issue for our students. And thank you for coming forward, Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, our board members do have the memorandum. I also have Matt, who is in my kitchen, I can afford the board of the professional grant for this. Again, uh, my name is uh, Armando Gutierrez. I'm with the city of Peralta. I'm the director of public works. And I'm here on the of Yeah, we get to close it. And you're fine, Mr. Chair. Oh, okay. That was our first uh, night back into the boardroom. So we're getting all of the uh, books out. So, books out, yes. So please, it's not you. But we're, you know, everything's going well, so just keep talking. All right. Okay. Anyways, as I was saying, uh, I'm the director of public works for the city of Port Arthur. My name is Armando Gutierrez, and I'm here on behalf of the city. I was approached by uh, a couple of uh, council members with a, an idea that we have to provide some uh, pedestrian uh, safety for the students as they walk around the high school towards uh, Lake Arthur Black. Uh, we look at uh, I look at the uh, at the area first and uh, determined that I could not put a sidewalk and perhaps. Uh, that was the reason why someone has not been built on the Port Arthur. The uh, street of uh, Port Arthur, I mean, I'm sorry, I keep saying Port Arthur. The 9th Avenue, from 9th Avenue, uh, 9th Avenue from uh, south of Lake Arthur Drive towards, uh, well, actually, towards this area here, if you notice, is not a uh, curving gutter street, but rather a, uh, one of those uh, urban, uh, what do you call it, road design where the street has a crowd and, and the water flows to the side of the Drainage on the side. That is the uh, the drainage system for the road. So there, by the high school and by the field, uh, where the softball field is, other property, um, you know that there is a drainage, and the drainage collects the water that runs off the street and flows north of, towards the ditch that's behind the school property, the north side school property. So that makes it uh, impossible to provide a sidewalk. So. I came up with, with a, uh, a design that we could provide a sidewalk in that area if the school district were to dedicate a five-foot sidewalk placement on the school property, which would be just on, on the, just on the inside of the power poles. The power poles normally uh, indicate where the property line is, so for the, in this case, where the street right away line is. The power poles being on the street right away, and the property line is just behind the power poles. On the front side of the park, which is where I'm saying that if you look carefully, you will see a, a, a swell, a great ditch that collects the water. And uh, to put in a sidewalk there would mean having to do a massive uh, British school by putting an underground pipe in, in there. So a sidewalk on the, just on the other side of the park poles will facilitate the, uh, the sidewalk and uh, allow for a sidewalk that would go from the service drive uh, north <laughs> and then it has to tie into the sidewalk that's by the uh, Therapist's uh, side of their corner. Once you get to that uh, property, then you have to cross walks on Lake Arthur Drive and, North, and Ninth Avenue with uh, the new lights that we just installed. The city installed those lights uh, back a few months ago. <coughs> so the system will work. Now, what I, and that's, that's the method I provide there. Uh, in further discussions with the council and the members in particular who are interested in this project, they asked me to approach the city. I mean the school district here, and see if they, uh, we could complete the sidewalk all the way into the property. So if you look at the map that I just provided, it shows the sidewalk. 
it's actually, it's actually like my face here. Show the sidewalk on 9th Avenue, going from Baycroft Drive down to the entrance of the service drive behind the uh, school building. This section right here will be the sidewalk that actually goes alongside the service drive towards the, uh, uh, the baseball field, uh, that is actually going towards the tennis courts. I believe the sidewalk is at that point. There's a sidewalk uh, by the tennis courts that reaches out to the uh, baseball field and ends at that point. So we would tie in the sidewalk at that point and run it towards the street and then north uh, along 9th Avenue but inside the park poles. And then right here you see the new ship. There's an inlet for the uh, drainage ends that uh, both sides each ends at that point. So the sidewalk will switch over to the street right away and then go out and connect to the existing sidewalk. The, uh, the, and this item was presented to the, to the city council this morning. It was on the, on the agenda for the, for the council, and the council approved it, uh, providing, uh, building, uh, assuming that the whole sidewalk is built. The cost of the sidewalk, uh, the entire sidewalk, is about $45,000. I'll give an exact amount, $45,000. $116.80. That is the cost that, that the city has. The city has a contractor on board that does uh, sidewalks for the city. And so uh, we asked our contractor, and that's the price he gave us for that sidewalk. $45,160. The council is offering that if the school board is interested, we could uh, go on a 50 50 partnership for the, for the cost of sidewalk. Now, the construction plans, I will do those in house. Uh, the value of those construction plans will be about eight to nine thousand dollars. We will do that in house and sort of cost. The acquiring the, uh, the easements or the easement, the sidewalk easement, is something that can prepare the uh, documents in house as well. And another thing that we will need will be some type of an agreement between the, uh, the school board and the city, uh, so this is to move forward. So I will need those, and I we will prepare those and, and submit to the uh, school district. Uh, Legal department for them to review, and, uh, and, and, and likewise, we will submit it to the uh, legal department and <coughs> city for them to review. And if everything is in order, we we'll, we'll get those documents signed, executed, and we could begin the project. So that is what was presented to the, to the, to the city this morning and uh, accepted by the city. Yes, sir. Okay, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, how long will it take to complete that project? And will it interfere with uh, the work that we have going on now at no, the ninth grade center? No, no the, the sidewalk, the construction sidewalk is, is uh, very uh, minimal. It wouldn't have any, uh, any uh, intrusions uh, or interfere with the work. And it's a sidewalk that normally is rebuilding in a matter of maybe two weeks. The so. traffic in the evening after school right. uh, in that area is sort of congested going. Our buses go that way mm -hmm. uh, to get to the park. We, we can coordinate, we can coordinate it. Uh, we built a sidewalk on Whitney uh, Elementary uh, off of Stadium and uh, what is it, 25th Street, one of the streets. We built that one last year and uh, we, we can have no problems. Okay. So, Next, uh, will that include, will the sidewalk include wheelchair and yes. school access? That, that is required in all sidewalks. Trustee Yes, with the uh, sidewalk, I, I noticed you said that the, the street over there, not that big, slopes down and the water runs off. Mm -hmm. uh, you notice when it rains in that particular area, when the water runs off, it, it actually floods that area. Uh, we want, you want to build the sidewalks on the uh, left side uh, of the poles, uh, power poles, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, in that area, it's supposed to be a ditch there. Will the, uh, the ditch is not being there is going to cause flooding on the sidewalk because that area floods. Will the city provide a ditch right there? Will it dig up that ditch area right there so the water can't flow? You're talking about a ditch in the, in the school property? Right right on the edge when, when the, uh, after the curve, because it's written, actually no curve there, it's a, it, it slopes off into oh. the grass when it rains. Oh. So when it rains, the water is going to uh, flood that area and, and, and if the ditch is not dug out right there, it's going to potentially flood on to, to the sidewalk, which will cause hazard the kids walking back into the streets. Okay, you're talking about the service drive going to the school property. Uh, right. Normally, the sidewalks are built uh, abutted to the curb at the same elevation as the curb. So, 
So whatever's existing on the, on the curb, that will be the same elevation as the sidewalk. Yeah, we, we don't build a sidewalk higher than the curb or lower the curb because it, it, it poses a creeping hazard. So the sidewalks are built, and my, my, my plan was to build a sidewalk above, it, above to the curb at the same elevation, flush with the, with the top of the curb. Madam President, uh, just asking and reiterating, could we possibly put a cauldron there where the water could run into the cauldron rather than over the sidewalk? Like we do in the residential areas? We could, yes. Yeah, we, we will break the curb and, uh, and install a, a, a pipe, and then uh, when we build a sidewalk, we prepare the curb. So the pipe will be built into the curb and underneath the sidewalk. Yes, we can do that. Thank you. Trustees? Um, sir, what is the total cost of the The total cost of the construction only, just the construction only, was $45,160.80. And you're asking the school district to... <coughs> yes, the, the, the offer made by the, by the city council is to go 50 50 Of course, there will be other, other, other work that the city will do to move up several other costs, like preparing plans, uh, preparing the documents, etc. Is this normally the, the process that's taken when you all entertain ideas of sidewalks and things of this nature to ask uh, the, the other parties to defray half of that cost? Do you normally do that? Well, the, the reason that the council uh, offered the 50-50 is that uh, we're looking at actually two sections of sidewalk. The section that's along the street, uh, for example, like we, we build that at, our, at the city cost, and then the section that goes inside the, the, the school property, and that will be really more of a private concept. So uh, by doing it all at once, you know, we like so we have a contract, we have contractors, we will manage the project, uh, we design it, I can do it all. And essentially we just uh, build two parts under one agreement and we just go 50 50. Okay, so so that I'm absolutely clear about this project. Uh, this is a project that was a brainchild of the city of Port Arthur. And I think there were some leaders that came forth to this board and spoke to the superintendent about um, dividing the cost. And it was your idea to begin with. But now we're going to pay half of it. So my question is, is that normally how it would be done? Is this normally the way you would build sidewalks or any other types of improvements? Is it the responsibility of that person or that party to pay half the cost? Normally, the city would not build sidewalks inside the private property. We would only build a sidewalk along that Avenue. So, a uh, sidewalk from, from that corner of the service drive in that Avenue into the property would not be built. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, yeah. let me know. Uh, and I'm not very able to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Next, Madam President, Board of Trustees, we are celebrating National Hispanic Heritage Month. All of you received a book uh, that we, we create each year. This year, the theme is Hispanics, One Endless Voice to Enhance Our Traditions. The uh, Heritage Month is from September 15th through October 15th, and there are a lot of um, activities that are happening at the school, so we invite you to attend some of them. And that concludes our staff reports. Thank you, Dr. Uh, one other thing uh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I did want to recognize there, there's been a lot of things while we're doing staff reports, a lot of things that are going on. Dr. Vine and uh, get would have been working with our principals and Focusing on the needs of our students, uh, Dr. Gibbwood has coined, uh, and I keep this in my head, we're not, uh, you said we're not, we're not remediated, we accelerated, and that's a good thing, so we're getting rid of the remediation type. Um, Mrs. Jeans, of course, is working with our Chapter 41 election that will come up on November the 6th, and uh, that is part of what you heard uh, tonight, some things. Mrs. Londo is, is finding certified teachers and moving along. And today we had something good happen to us, and I'll let Mrs. Bailey talk about this, what happened currently today. Why she's coming, Madam President, yes. Dr. Porter, would you, uh, that was something that was discussed um, during the public participation that you had to correct one of our citizens. Oh, 
Frank. Madam President, we want to pull number six. We're pulling item number six. Trustee. Trustees. Okay, with item number six being pulled, and I will call for a motion on items one through five. Item seven to three. Is there a motion? Motion. Sir. There is a motion by Trustee Reed, second by Trustee Frank. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The consent agenda is approved with the exception of number six. Um, consider and if appropriate, accept the prim quarter finding, excuse me. Consider and if appropriate, accept the prim quarter finding group application for an appraised value limitation on qualified property to authorize the superintendent to review the application for completeness and submit to the comptroller and to authorize the superintendent to enter into any agreement to extend the deadline for board action beyond 150 days subject to board ratification. Dr. Corey. Thank you. Uh, you. We have been apprised of um, what is going on. We're glad Mrs. Stoll is here with us and we are asking for approval of the item. I move to approve that the reinvestment, the reinvestment zone as presented in application from Primco Refinery Group. Second. 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 I move to adopt the findings as presented by the consultants on the application 1205 from the Primco Refining Group. I move to approve application number 1205 and the agreement with the Primco Refining Company Incorporated as recommended by the council and the district consultants for the appraised value limitation on quali qualified property for the school district maintenance and operation taxes pursuant to chapter 313 of the Texas tax code. I second. It has been moved and seconded by Vice Vice President Brown, second by Trustee Frank. All those in favor say aye. 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 The agenda, item number six, is approved. Dr. Yes, Madam President, you do have the list of teachers that we are asking for approval. Consider and appropriate approve the employment of teachers. Consider and appropriate approve the termination of professional employees. Uh, number one, is there a motion? There is. Uh, motion, considering if appropriate, approve the employment of teachers. Is there a motion? So, Madam President, I, I uh, second that motion. So it's all right. <laughs> is there a second? Second. It has been moved by Trustee Johnson, second by Trustee Frank. All those in favor say aye. 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 Consider and if appropriate, approve the termination of a professional employee. Is there a motion? Motion. Motion second. by Trustee Frank, second by Trustee Johnson. All those in favor say aye. <coughs> aye. aye. Information, Dr. Before uh, I give the information, just a little clarity. I know every month we approve the information, the average daily enrollment. Just to give you a little history for our audience, the average daily enrollment and the enrollment figures are two different entities. Uh, our enrollment is 8,303. The average daily enrollment is 8,104. Uh, that is the number of students who come every day. That is the average of students who come. And that is how we get our funding through attendance, the weighted average daily attendance. So we encourage our, our, teach our parents to send, schools, uh, send their children to schools every day. And there was a, um, a sample like if you have students that miss nine days during a 180 day period, that is 5% of the fund, funding loss uh, to a student who comes to school every day. So. We receive the money, money on average daily attendance, not enrollment. So that's why it's so important for parents to send their children to school every day. The average daily enrollment is 8,104. The average daily attendance in percent is 96.67%. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, well, at this time, if there's no more business, I'll call for enrollment. Is there a motion? So moved. Let's go. 
We're adjourned. Thank you.